Hello, and thanks for listening to Forward, a podcast about the compelling stories, important issues, and memorable art that move us. My name is Mari. And my name is Christopher. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're talking about political correctness. This term has ignited a culture war, spurred new generation of advocacy, and started to reshape the media. But have all the controversies, tweets, and takedowns instilled any positive, sustainable changes to our society? Before we wade into that, we'll get started with our Article Forward segment, where we share two stories that got us thinking this week. Mari, what do you have for us? So my article is from the Chicago Tribune uh, from this past week or so. Uh, it's called Stanford Professor Says the Workplace is the Fifth Leading Cause of Death in the U.S. And basically this article is um, interviewing this guy who, you know, did this huge study and wrote this book all about workplace stress and how it's literally killing us. Um, the article starts out, workplace stress, the result of conditions like long hours, lack of health insurance, little autonomy on the job, and high job demands don't just hit productivity or damage morale, they're killing us. Uh, the His book is based on a 2015 paper that said more than 120,000 deaths a year and roughly 5 to 8% of annual healthcare costs may be attributable to how U.S. companies manage their workforces, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. You know, everybody hates work and everybody's stressed out and everybody sees that, you know, these long hours and poor work-life balance and, you know, being micromanaged uh, is annoying and stressful, but in actual fact, it's harmful to your health. And it apparently is contributing to, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of deaths in America. Um, another point that this uh, this guy was saying is that uh, instead of adding wellness programs or yoga classes, companies need to focus more on the management practices that lead to substantial health issues, such as layoffs, job insecurity, toxic cultures, and long hours. You'll definitely recognize some of the things they're talking about. Um, and it's all just about how companies need to rethink the way that they manage their workers in order to benefit the overall health, not just of workers, but of the nation as a whole. And I actually really love this article, too. And one of my favorite parts about it probably is most of you are probably thinking, how do you measure stuff like this? He's talking about stress in the workplace leading to death. I think the major takeaway I got from this article was that a lot of this is much easier to measure and much easier to regulate than you think. So a lot of what you're reading about is potentially something we could actually act on. Absolutely. And my article is called, Are You Really In Love If It's Not On Instagram?, which was in the New York Times this last week. So pretty much everyone out there probably has some friend who seems to be acting out their relationship in real time on Instagram. And by this, I mean, you know what they made for dinner, you know what they did on the weekend, and the, the last movie they saw, all their favorite hobbies. So much so, it feels like you're a part of this relationship, whether or not you actually want to be. So this article takes a deeper look at this behavior. I mean, it's a funny read for sure, but it also makes you reflect on your own behavior. Whether or not you're in a long-term relationship, this article makes you wonder about why do you post the things you do? Are you doing it for yourself? Are you doing it for your friends? Are your intentions good? Are they selfish? And when it comes to relationships, it's even more complicated. And something that's intimate by its very nature, is that intimacy compromised when so much of it is made public? How much of your relationship should be private? One interesting story in this article actually shows how the public side of our relationships can begin to influence how you feel about the private side. And it can actually make you start to overlook negative aspects of your relationship because on this other spectrum, you have a running timeline of all the positive things you've done. And lastly, if you enjoyed the topic of our first podcast where we talk all about content creation, this is pretty much on the same wavelength. Um, and both of those links will be in the description uh, on SoundCloud beneath the audio. Next up is our forward thinking segment. In this segment, we take a closer look at one topic that's been on our minds. This episode, we're focusing on the growing movement that's advocating for more politically correct speech and a more PC society overall, and digging deeper into the motivations driving this movement and its outcomes to date. By now, we're all familiar with the takedown. 
These days, hardly a week goes by without a public figure saying something politically incorrect, which causes an army of advocates to rise up to confront them. This confrontation has been escalating for years, and it's become a full-on culture war. There are simply too many examples to cite here, but despite the sheer number, every instance plays out largely the same. There's the initial affront, whether it's intentional or the result of thoughtlessness, and then a community of activists calls that person out in a swift, public, punishing, and kind of black and white way. But is this an effective formula for people to encourage more socially aware speech in our culture? Is there a better way? Mari, before we dive in, it might be helpful to define what we mean by politically correct speech, since it means different things to different people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as we'll talk about, I'm not a huge fan of the term politically correct speech, um, just because it has such negative connotations and it's so polarizing. Um, But when I talk about this type of speech, what I mean is speech that is sensitive to the context of those who have been marginalized or oppressed or people who have such suffered trauma. So, you know, it's just um, choosing your words carefully so that you aren't um, ignoring or pushing to the side. So, you know, the very real experiences of people who you just don't identify with, you know, just experiences that you don't have, but they are still really real and potentially painful. And, you know, I think that the, the counter argument is that, oh, well, you know, if people are um, so hurt or offended by, you know, people being insensitive in their speech, then they're just being too sensitive, you know, because it's just words. Um, you know, you shouldn't be so hurt by something that somebody who who doesn't know you, just somebody on the internet, what they say. Um, but for me, I think what the bigger problem is, is that if, you know, if you're somebody famous and you have a big platform um, and what you say gets heard by millions of people, And if you're saying things that perpetuate certain ideas about groups of people who are already marginalized or oppressed, that can contribute to real oppression and real marginalization, not just people's hurt feelings. Just even the fact that the word politically correct in itself is so polarizing, it just shows that the it just shows that this broader cultural war is fought on so many fronts. It's fought on um, what people are saying, how they're saying it, the types of words that we're using. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I honestly even lose track of what we're fighting over Mm -hmm. in the moment. Um, But I just know that we're fighting over something. Yeah. And sometimes it even depends on who's saying it, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. You know, the same the same words from two different people might be taken differently. Um, And yeah, I think Part of um, where it gets into this like sort of feeling like a a culture war is what you were talking about in the beginning where someone says something and then people just jump on it. You know, they just jump on it and they're just like that you like you can't say that. Like, how can you do that? You know, that's like that's wrong. That's this. That's that. And, you know, it very well may may have been wrong. Um, But the problem is that at least from what I've seen um, that kind of knee-jerk attack doesn't seem to uh, lend itself to getting people to think more thoughtfully about the topic, and it doesn't make them want to be more sensitive because they're then they're on the defensive. So the more I kept thinking about this, and I wrote this in my notes in a few places, this whole idea of this being a broader culture war or some kind of warfare is almost too apt. And... This even kind of feels like the way we deal with prison and deal with criminals in this country, where it's a focus first on punishment. Mm -hmm. Um, Someone committed something we we don't like or, you know, don't deem acceptable. We immediately need need to punish them. It needs Mm -hmm. to be swift. And then we need to get rid of them. Um, And... I, I mean, obviously, I'm not the first person who said that that the prison system doesn't really work whatsoever. It doesn't help people um, realize why what they did is wrong, and 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 neither does this system that we've built either. Right. It, to put it into the prison debate terms, um, there's no focus on rehabilitation. No, not at all. It, uh, so you have someone who, um, again, says something not socially aware, and then immediately, I would say, within an hour. I mean, we've really built up this crazy trap where within an hour, someone is called out. Mm -hmm. Um, And it just really snowballs from there. Um, And and, and I think this idea of having it be public is part of that. This idea of rallying the troops 
right, where you somehow want to call it out right away, and by calling it out quick, you're there first, and then when someone else starts to look at it, they can immediately start to retweet, and it, you know, and it begins to snowball, mm-hmm. and and because this is warfare, and and not actually trying to help people think differently or be more thoughtful it's about who can shout the loudest who has the most troops right and well that's where it starts to for me start to look more like like an ego thing rather than like trying to do the right thing um and this is just like from my personal experience just kind of seeing people you know calling people out on twitter on facebook or whatever it it almost seems like this sort of contest where people are competing to see who is the most woke, you know, and like who is the most socially aware and who's really at the end of the day, who is the rightest? Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. And who's the most morally superior? Whatever. Like we should all, you know, strive to be moral and good and like on the side of of what's right. But um, it's it shouldn't be about, you know, yourself. It should be about like doing what's right. And, you know, and I I see it even with people who are who are friends, you know, like they know each other personally and they all know that they're like on the same team, so to speak. Like they're all kind of like, you know, in favor of the same things and and are, you know, have the same kind of political beliefs. But even then, I've seen, you know, one of my friends say something about some issue and maybe they don't use exactly the right words or like they phrase it in a way that make somebody else say like you know that's really not the way that you should say it and then they you know the people who are ostensibly on the same side come in and say like no you know you can't say it like that like this is the wrong way to go about it like well you you you're not thinking about this you're not thinking about that and it's like definitely helpful to like keep people aware of things but when you frame it as a like no you're wrong and like i'm right and i'm gonna set you straight I don't think that that is super conducive to um, fostering a, a, a conversation. No, I mean, we've we've essentially turned something that had good intentions to start that for really as long as time, no one had really been in check in terms of how they talk about other members of society mm-hmm, and absolutely. really their speech in general. And so this backlash, I think, is is overall a good thing we're starting to have this counterweight but typically of this country we just go to the extreme and with this focus on punishment as fast as possible with you know really the self at the center you know Mm -hmm. it's like how can i improve my visibility and my brand and be the most right Mm -hmm. i was thinking a lot about too of the person in the comments who writes first you know (laughs) this like champion who gets to the story first and just writes first in the comments Mm -hmm. I think there is this reaction for some people who want to be the first person to call someone out. Mm -hmm. I was there first. I'm going to get all the retweets. I was the most right and Mm -hmm. the quickest to be right. Yeah. I was the first one to see that this person was wrong. (laughs) Right. And yeah. And it's like, and I think the, the comparison to the criminal justice system is, is pretty apt as well as the, the way that, you know, we were talking about, a couple weeks ago about how children are disciplined it's all the same thing where there's you know somebody does something that you know maybe is very wrong you know like let's say that somebody does something that's really wrong um and then the people who witness it or who are affected by it have this feeling of of anger because they've been wronged you know like they're they feel hurt um and so they immediately come back they immediately like react in anger at, with like you know vengeance and punishment as the goal and you know for for a lot of people who have you know been oppressed or, like his, you know historically and have been marginalized and have experienced oppression in their day-to-day lives you understand why they're angry absolutely and i i definitely do understand when someone you know has just had enough that day and wants to come come back and say no you're wrong but there are definitely a lot of people who are not coming from that context and they're just coming in to say, like, I, I'm right and you're wrong. And I wonder if part of the part of the problem, too, is at the end of the day, the goal is not to change anyone's mind mm-hmm. beyond. I think the goal is the goal is to punish mm-hmm. and which we've talked about 
And I think the goal is to create some kind of larger deterrent for for others. Mm, yeah. Just like the prison system, right? Yep. Where we we give people a large sentence to deter anyone else who wants to do that. And right. so, you know, someone says something that's not correct. Again, whether they meant to do it or not, mm -hmm. if we all jump on them and make it so they can't work for a few years and, you know, in whatever business they're in, mm -hmm. people are going to think twice <laughs> before they do it. And right. that's the problem, though, because... Mm -hmm sometimes you might benefit from from having a conversation but instead now mm -hmm. you just feel hostile i can't say anything right yeah yeah i can't say anything like the the sjw thought police or blood oh, or yeah, whatever right? and uh and yeah and so obviously like they same like same thing with like all the other stuff we talk about with like with regard to punishment they're not learning from it no they're just they've just been taught that they can't do that you yeah, know, like for, the, because of, you know, whatever, because of the rule, you know? The number one thing I hear in reaction to all this is, I can't say anything anymore. I yeah. just can't say anything. Exactly. And it's just like, well, of course, of course you can say anything. You can, you can say anything that's on your mind. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, sometimes you might just need to be a little bit more thoughtful. Right. Um, You're taking away the wrong conclusion from right. this. Right, exactly. And, you know, and a lot of that is on them, you know, yeah. like, because they don't, they don't want to take the extra time to, to be sensitive and to think about how other people would feel. And, you know, I always think of it as like, well, you know, if like, let's say your friend, their like parent just passed away or something. If you are the type of person that's like, oh, I should be able to say anything I want. Like, do you think that you should be able to say to your friend whose parent just died? Like, you know, like say terrible things about their parents? Like, the, no, like you would think you would think about that and you would be more careful about what you said. And that's the same thing with sort of like socially aware speech. It's just that it's on a bigger scale and there are people on a larger scale who have suffered things that, you know, maybe you don't understand. And so that's all that pe I think people really want. Um, but yeah, when it when it turns into this, what do they call it? Like clicktivism, where it's like, yeah. <laughs> like these like kind of Facebook yeah. like activists and they like they come out of the woodwork. And, you know, like going back to what I was saying about, um, uh, you know, people who... You know, people who have definitely, like, suffered, like, I understand where that anger comes from, but so much of this comes from uh, um, privileged, you know, white people, like, straight white people who haven't personally experienced a lot of that stuff, but, you know, they're they're coming out in force because they want to be allies, and it's great to be an ally, but when, when people are so, like, dogmatic and so um, vicious in attacking other people who they think have like kind of done something wrong it's it almost seems like they're trying to compensate for the fact that they haven't really experienced oppression you know and they're like i i know all like i know about this this suffering even though i haven't experienced it and you you are wrong and i'm going to tell you about it you know well and the idea of dogma is just it's just so alienating mm -hmm. it makes it even hard to bring in new allies and to welcome other people but instead you just kind of entrench you know you just build deeper trenches that no one can come into mm -hmm. and then the minute you see someone in this like no man's land and they commit something wrong you just take them down yeah just take them down exactly well and and i think a lot of a lot of the issue that we're talking about here is really the result of the medium in which this is conducted in mm -hmm. it's all over the internet mm -hmm. so we talk about the fact that it's swift I'm, i mean that's just the fact that the internet moves quickly and and the internet's built to have things snowball and so this naturally does and the internet doesn't allow any nuance in its discussion mm -hmm. so therefore everything here is black and white whether or not people even want it to be mm -hmm. i think too when you can't understand where someone was coming from, all you have is whatever text they wrote or whatever they said, you you can't even allow it to be nuanced. You just got to say, I got to take that at face value and this is my stance. Right. And then it goes the other way too where, you know, someone says something that maybe they didn't really think anything about um, and maybe they are an asshole, but uh, then someone else interprets it however they do and then they come at them with, you know, whatever words they say. But then the original person doesn't have any idea of that person's context, you know, so they don't understand why they're coming at them all of a sudden. And then they think, well, you know, like, what's wrong with you, you know? And so it's just this like two people kind of like talking to a brick wall mm -hmm. because they don't see each other and they don't understand each other. Whereas like the, the times that I've had conversations like that in person, 
went much differently yeah. because you know it's usually somebody that i knew at least a, a little bit and they kind of knew where i was coming from and i knew where they were coming from and you know it's mu- for most people it's much harder in person to just be like no you're wrong you're an asshole like you're just an evil person you know like it because when you're face to face with somebody it's like oh well you know you don't want to get in a fight so it's like well you know actually i actually think it's kind of more like this and you know it's a little bit nicer oh i mean it's so easy to fight on the internet oh yeah i I, like like it's almost easier to fight than to be nice and and i just think that the way the internet keeps a permanent record of everything you don't want a permanent record of you admitting you're wrong. I think there's oh, no. like this, like, you know, like subconscious fear. Yeah, you're right. God forbid. Yeah. And it's just like even politics just further reinforce this where um, someone will say something now and then they'll go back in, into that person's timeline three years later. It's like you're a flip flopper. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like, exactly. like, I love everything but Donald Trump when he says something um you know, like nowadays, whatever nonsense he's talking about. And then people will go back in his timeline three years later on Twitter. And he obviously says the exact, the exact opposite, opposite yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, and so now it's like, you got to stick to your mm-hmm. lines. You got to always be on, on the stump mm-hmm. giving your messages. No, it's true. And, you know, we kind of talked about this in the first episode with, with the social media stuff where you kind of, everyone is a content creator in a way. And like you were saying, everyone is kind of creating their own brand, even just on Facebook. You know, I... I know any anytime like a certain article comes up or a certain post comes up in my feed, I can almost always guess who shared it. But yeah, you you're kind of cultivating this brand for yourself, whether you realize it or not. And so then you have to kind of back that up with anytime somebody challenges it. You know, it's like, well, I know about this. This is my thing. So and and you're wrong about this thing. Um, in addition to thinking about kind of everything that's wrong and and I think just to clarify, I mean, I think at the end of the day, I would almost rather have this system mm-hmm. than nothing, right? Just kind of let people run amok and let this toxic language persist. I'd rather have it go challenge, even in, even if it gets challenged in perhaps not the most constructive way. Yeah, somebody need, does need to be saying, oh, that's not okay. Yeah, right? Yeah. And And I think down the road like how do you start to improve some of this stuff i mean Mm -hmm. i think it's very difficult in the sense like how can you get everyone on the same page but i was really thinking about two things Mm -hmm. um that i think could potentially help fix some of this one thing that i was thinking about is you you actually touched on this earlier where people who have this large audience have this bigger responsibility i i do think it's in the hands of people who shape opinion and shape culture to wise up a little bit and also to be more sensitive, more forgiving. And I think a lot about the times whenever I'm, I'm like reading articles from them about some of these issues that crop up or like the latest takedown, they always have a pretty thorough review of it um, and just a thoughtful analysis. And I think that's what's needed. It's when all of these people who shape culture just kind of devolve into the shouting match is when we're truly in trouble. Yeah, I agree. And right now, kind of what we have is people trying to keep others accountable. You know, mm-hmm. this is like the idea of accountability. And to me, like the idea of accountability is is very much like um, checks coming in from the outside, you know, like external checks mm-hmm. on your behavior. And that's accountability. But like what you were saying, I think we need to focus more on responsibility Mm -hmm. rather than accountability and responsibility comes from within. And it's like a a personal um, sort of commitment to, you know, understanding the impact that you have on other people and on, you know, society and realizing that when you have a big impact, you, you do need to take more responsibility for yourself. And, you know, like you, like being famous usually doesn't happen by accident. It's usually something that you've worked really hard to maintain and is something that you've chosen. And with being famous comes a lot of power and a lot of influence and usually a lot of money. And the trade-off is that maybe you need to be a little bit more careful. Just kind of building off what you said there, I saw this article recently about how major book publishers are starting to hire what they call sensitivity readers. I love it. And we'll see. It's funny that you say you love it. I do. Because in the comments below it, it was like, what kind of world are we in? We can't say anything. Now we have to hire all these readers just to make sure our books are sensitive. I'm like, isn't that kind of the ultimate positive outcome of 
of all this advocacy is we start to change our behavior and be a little more responsible. So I, I came away from that thing like, this is great. Um, and, and if more, more big publishers and more media companies take a little extra step to be more responsible, I think then you'll start to see the positive change. And, and, and I think that's kind of what I was getting at earlier about yeah. people who influence culture. Um, they need to be extra sensitive. Absolutely. Like even taking that down to the micro level again, like, you know, I was talking about, oh, if your friend's parent passed away, you would obviously be more careful about what you said to them around that time. Um, think about if you worked in a school, like you were like an, a volunteer in a school or something and you wanted to make little like um, goodie bags for the kids or whatever. I'm just trying to make this up off mm. the top of my head. And um, you like wrote on it like, oh, you know, say hi to your mom for me, something like that. And then you gave it out to all the kids. But you don't know that one of the kids like their mom just died. Mm -hmm. The sensitivity reader is basically the equivalent of like the teacher of that classroom kind of just like looking over all of the things that you made and saying like, oh, actually, like this kid's mom just died. So maybe don't write say hi to your mom for me. Yeah. You know, it's like it's such a simple thing to do that you know, would just you know not hurt somebody like cause isn't, yeah. isn't you know i don't i just think that that's a nice thing to do is just try not to hurt people no i totally agree i think this is my last point about maybe how things could get better this idea of starting to forgive people who might have made a mistake once or twice and i think we haven't gotten to that yet or at least like i can't think of anyone who had been on on the receiving end of of a takedown whether or not they did again on purpose or not rebuild their career after that i think we're so early into this type of advocacy but i think ideally there needs to be this type of forgiveness where you can be called out and demonstrate that um, you feel differently or think differently and kind of like reintegrate again like i know i'm using terms that are more uh, closely associated with prison but just <laughs> it feels like it's so tightly connected no i agree it's it's it, it is a mindset you know it's a whole mindset of um of reacting uh with the with the intent of punishment and you know i think that 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 is that's a mindset that is is not just limited to you know the u.s it's it's definitely like a, a human thing um but yeah if i think if we as a society could move away from that mindset a little bit then a lot of aspects of our society would be a little nicer and yeah like i i know that it's so hard to be patient and be forgiving and be like kind to people who you see as being oppressors and maybe they don't deserve it but not everybody and this is my opinion i don't think that everybody who's is uninformed and who says something insensitive is necessarily part of the problem you know i think that i think that most people are are mostly just acting out of being unaware and just being like uneducated on certain topics and i think that everybody can learn and everybody can become better and so i think maybe that's kind of what i try to keep in mind and what i hope other people keep in mind is that most people are not being assholes on purpose and most people probably do want to be better people and you know want people to like them and want to be you know and don't want to be assholes you know and so i think that if we can you know try to be if we can all everybody try to be a little more sensitive towards each other and try to be a little more you know just looking toward common ground and common solutions um, I don't know. I think we'll all be a little bit happier on the internet. I totally agree. All right. So the final segment of our podcast is called Watch List. In this segment, we recommend one TV show or movie that's flying beneath the radar but worth checking out. Mari, what are we recommending this week? So there's this movie called Pariah, um, which was written and directed. Written and directed. By uh, Dee Reese, um, who recently also directed the movie Mudbound. That was a great movie. Obviously, there's a lot of buzz about that, but this is one of her earlier movies called Pariah, and it's about this uh, teenage girl in New York who is a closeted lesbian, and it's just all about her kind of like coming-of-age story and her relationships with her parents and her sister and her friends, and it's all about this, you know, this young black girl who's coming to terms with her identity and trying to figure out um, how that fits in with with her 
friends and her community and her family. I mean, I thought the movie was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And it's the exact opposite of Mudbound. Pariah, despite the name, which you would think it'd be very depressing, Mm -hmm. um, was very hopeful. Mm -hmm. And I was so invested in in all the characters. Mm -hmm. And it was just a really great movie that I'd I'd recommend anyone to check out. And I think also, too, not to balloon this into a bigger discussion, I think it's movies like this that are um, easy to get into in the sense that they have really compelling characters. And even if it's they're in a situation that you would never be in, you feel for them and you kind of broaden your understanding. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. No, great movie. It's uh, it's actually on Netflix. So if you have Netflix, check it out. Really easy to access. Um, great movie. Highly recommend it. Well, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, search for FWD, that's forward, in iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We are now on Google Play as well. Or you can subscribe on SoundCloud. Thank you so much for listening. If you ever have any questions, thoughts, or topic suggestions, you can send us an email at forwardpodcast at gmail.com. That's fwdpodcast at gmail.com. Goodbye for now. Bye.